so uh, we were initially we were talking about like giving more of the same thing, kind of best practices back and forth. But Brian actually showed the best practice that we think um, is available right now. So I'm gonna do, do something else. The first thing I'm gonna show is um, is the testing yeah. pyramid, right? We have to talk about testing pyramid over and over again. And I'm not the only one. Other people will show you testing pyramids today as well. And you know, I know Ken has a crazy one. Aaron. Aaron's pyramid is a cube, like, what's, what's going on? <laughs> okay, um, here's our pyramid, right? It's kind of standard. At the bottom, you have unit tests. In the middle, you have integration tests. And on the very, very top, you have end-to-end -end tests. And obviously, Chrome team did not do end-to-end -end tests where you, do, you know, use double screen mirroring, obviously. <laughs> and the shape of a pyramid is not really determined by the user or by what we want to do. It's determined by the tools we have today. So that's why we write a bunch of unit tests. Ask your, you know, your users, hey, do you like the fact that you know, I wrote 10,000 unit tests? And they say, I, I don't care. You know? Write end-to-end -end tests so like when I switch display mirroring, my Chrome doesn't crash. Right? The users only care about that. But we write a lot of this just because we have excellent tools. In the JavaScript world, right, we have good unit test runners. Like Mocha is our favorite, but Jest is excellent. Ava is excellent. Jasmine is very useful. OK, a, a unit test is very simple. Get a piece of code, run it, assert the result. Once you move to integration, once you try to put pieces together, you have to bring more tools, right? Because for example, now you're putting components together, they need DOM. Where do you get DOM? Well, probably you use JS DOM, or you try to use Karma to launch a real browser. Now you have to stub things, right? And some people like stubbing, some people don't like stubbing. I don't know, you know argue with Justin. but. You do have to start stubbing things around because maybe you don't have a server yet. So for example, I like using NOC, right? So I don't have to have a server. And then you move, um, I mean, uh, React with Enzyme has both modes, right? You can shallow render a component or you can render the full component with all the children rendered. But once you move to end-to-end, -to -end, that's where things are really tricky and the best tools right now, aside from Cypress, you know, are here. And we all love to kind of laugh at uh, Selenium, but it's, it actually launches the real browser. You have full browser APIs. You don't have to chase JS DOM, but always chasing the real browser. So you don't have to work with, around JS DOM bugs. You just have to work around browser bugs. But you still need a little bit of stubbing. If you're testing Amazon checkout, you don't want to make a payment of a million dollars, right? You probably want to stop that payment call. So you do need full browser and some additional testing tools. In this case, it's a Cypress test for user logging in. And I'm sorry, I use kind of full thing for going through the GUI, opening a real page, entering user information, clicking enter, and then asserting that the page goes through. Excellent. So now let's argue. What's the shape of a pyramid? Is it wide base? Is it narrow? Is it inverted, what is it, uh, ice cream cone? Like, you know, whatever. So, one of the most popular guys says, okay, and Kent, I think, agrees, right? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm sure you'll say the same thing, right? Like, write tests, but not too many, and mostly integration, because that's where you put things together, right? That's what more realistically what you should be testing rather than unit tests. Okay. So what do we need for good integration tests? Well, we probably need a real DOM. You know, I'm sorry to say, but don't work against an emulation of a DOM that's behind. Work with real browser. You probably want to clean up the state between the tests because your test might actually be trying to break stuff. You don't want to have this logic, those like, broken pieces of data and state when the next uh, test starts. You want to stop the server, right? Because you might not have something running. So, you know, when you think about this, like, these are all requirements for end-to-end -end tests, real DOM, stubbing the server, right? So when I, you know, I was at that party and I realized it and I was like, oh my God, right? <laughs> Where is my Cypress for integration tests? Yeah, that's a typical representation of me at a party. Okay, so Cypress allows you to do end-to-end -end tests really easily. You visit a page and then you, you grab a login button and you click on it, right? Going through the GUI. What if we could do the next thing? Our login probably goes 
you know, is in a source file login. What if we could grab it and we'll give you some extra function instead of a visit, and instead of visiting a page, you could just mount your source and it would have actual live component in actual real world browser. And then you can interact with that component going through the DOM, just like you would interact with a real page. And that would be your integration test. The good thing about that, you have actual Cypress or Chrome or whatever browser you want or, or will want. And you can open DevTools and instead of you know, text rendering or you know, string rendering of login component, you would actually have real DOM you can inspect. You can look at the network request that component is making. You could stop it. You can look at styles. You could modify the styles. You could trigger hover state. You can actually inspect it using DevTools, the tools that you're using the every day to actually look at your pages. Excellent. That would be kind of cool. So instead of kind of starting at the bottom where you just have node and trying to bring extra emulations, you start at the top. You take the full browser and you make it more convenient to use your little components. And you do realize the truth, right? Your components are nothing but mini web apps. And this approach is what exactly Storybook is doing. The Storybook, as a tool, gives you an ability to take a component, mount, look at that. And they do it for demo purposes. But what if our storybooks could actually test the component, interact with the component? Not only you would have a demo, but you also have a test, a full feature component test. So this is how it looks right now in Cypress. Um, I'm taking a component, I'm mounting, and I'm interacting with, and I'm making assertions. And the cool thing about that, once the test is finished, I could actually go and actually play with a component, because it's running. It's like storybook with assertions. And it's already available. I can pop DevTools, do everything. Excellent. So I wrote adapters for all major frameworks. Except for Angular. Angular is a hard one to actually crack, but everything else is easy. <laughs> so this test, they kind of operate and replace this level of a pyramid, but I, I call them unit tests. And now the question in everyone's mind is like, why do you call it unit tests? I know, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Shock people in the audience, you know, call 911, you know, get them. Okay. Um, Going back to the basics, I have a function of two numbers. It adds, where does it get its inputs? From A and B, from the arguments object. Where does it you know, return the value? Through the JavaScript function mechanism, right? I call a function, I get back the result. So my unit test, in this case, would be call the function, pass to and free, get result, look at uh, the expected value, and we call this unit test, excellent. What if my function, instead of returning result, grab document, grab element, and then set the inner text? Not returning a value, but writing it in a DOM. Well, it gets the inputs, but it writes into the DOM instead of returning the result. So our task could do the same thing. It would call the function, but then would go grab that element and look at its inner text. But for some reason, we call this not the unit test. We call this integration test because it involves you know, interacting with a DOM. What if my arguments did not come from the arguments, but instead A and B came from local storage? So my function gets inputs from local storage, writes into the DOM. How would the test look? Well, I can write the arguments into the local storage, call the function, grab the DOM, look at the result. Why do we call this integration test? It still is unit test. So, if you look at components that we're working on in the front-end world, they get inputs from various sources, from the network, from the DOM, from local storage, anywhere, right? From web workers, service workers, from cookies, and they produce results. And those results could go anywhere. Storage, you know, DOM, everything. If we set up these inputs, we run our component, we should make assertions over whenever the component is writing to. It still is a unit test. So if our end-to-end -end looks like this, then our unit test looks like that. We mount a component, we interact with it, 
no matter how. And then our testing pyramid is really two levels, a lot of end-to-end -end and bunch of unit tests. And I was like, okay, I, I have my full Cypress API, batteries included, everything is there, nice. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna be the most popular guy online, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and I believe, it's hard to see, but this is a dog picture. <laughs> so on the internet, no one knows, but you, your tester is a dog, okay. Um, but that's how we do it, but that's not the end of it. We don't write as many tests as the pyramid suggests. First of all, we use linters. Linters allow you to skip writing some tests that catch dumb mistakes. We start using TypeScript, and uh, you know, that should prevent a couple of tests from being written. We use li libraries like Ronda and Lodash, so we don't have to write code, so we don't have to test it. Finally, we don't write all the edge cases. Instead, we rely on crash reporting to figure out what we have to test, right? So we write common test cases, but then if something goes wrong, we'll add more tests. So in reality, we're just testing this hole that you see right here. That's our pyramid, that little, little remaining thing. Okay, that was m me fighting, you know, about geometry with everyone on the internet. But I have a bigger problem. I have too many passing tests, right? We're paying like $500 to CircleCI every month for the privilege of passing tests that we never look at, right? <laughs> like, what the hell? <laughs> but there is a way to make passing tests, the tests that no one looks at, useful. And that's snapshot testing, you know, the thing that's really exciting. So just Ava now has, uh, you know, I wrote snapshot it. We even added it to Cypress as a plugin. You, you can actually get some value from previously successful tests. So in just, right? You, you call a function and you say to match snapshot. The first time it runs, the first time it's passing, it actually saves the results into a file. Excellent. Next time you run, and for example, if one of the values has changed, you will get an error. Excellent, great, love it. Now, my first successful build will actually do something useful. It will save those snapshots so that my you know, build number 1,000, by the way, this was supposed to be emoji, of course, not rendering when you need it. It compares current value with a previously saved value. Uh, you know, just showing good value and a box instead of emoji is not good, but <laughs> it, it works only for simple cases, right? In reality, you, the output that you save is actually gonna be more complex. So instead of showing the whole thing, saying, hey, there is an error, here's the output, we usually do the diff, right? The human vision, like, who had this uh, great slide saying we're trying to use our brain, and our brain is only meant to deal with, like, predators and, like, like, our vision and our understanding of nature is very, very motion sensitive, not static picture sensitive. So when you do a git commit you, and you do git diff, you only show the difference, you never show the whole thing. So if an object uh, uh, change in our snapshot, we only show the difference and we try to explain how it changed. Was the new property added or deleted? Or maybe the property value was modified, right? We're trying to intelligently explain what has changed. If uh, a line in big text blob has changed, then we show a diff saying, this is the line before, this is the line after, we ignore everything else, just show the diff. That's a big idea. Okay, so our friends at Percy.io, and also go to Apply Tools, one of the sponsors, they have excellent UI for doing this. So Apply Tools, for example, and Percy, they now do screenshot diffing. So every time your CI runs, it saves a screenshot that compares with a previously saved good screenshot. And if anything has changed, it will highlight in red the pixels that are different. And it's very, very useful. And in reality, it's nothing but a snapshot testing, right? You take a screenshot and you say to match previously saved snapshot. Except we have a problem. The pixels are nothing but triples, right? Red, green, blue. So really you're comparing just two two-dimensional arrays of zero to 255, and it's very hard to actually understand that, okay, so yeah, some pixels have changed, like what's going on? Should I worry about that? 
is it within tolerance? So screenshot diffing, right? Just like snapshot diffing, it just shows us what has changed, right? And what we were thinking is that we should go beyond that. And the next step in testing, in JavaScript especially, and in end-to-end -end testing in particular, would be to go beyond that. And I'll show what we mean. OK, so imagine you have a screenshot, and it shows you that, hey, like this thing has changed. This thing has changed. Right now, it's operating at pixel level. It just sets those pixels to red. What we really think is that if these things have changed somehow, that change is due to something in a page, a DOM difference, maybe CSS difference, right? We want to have a tool that not compares the screenshots pixel by pixel, but instead goes back and tells us, hey, here's the difference. The background color changed on a logo, and this produced this change. There was some change here, but this is really because there is a new line in the index HTML that got added since the previous snapshot. That's what we want to work on. Not just show you, hey, pixels change. Why? I, I don't know. We really want to show you the dumb difference that tells you how the page changed, not just what has changed. And even remi re rewinding a little bit more, so there is a change in, HTML, uh, in CSS and a change in index HTML. But why has it changed? What, what caused the change? So you have to rewind a little bit more and look at the application difference. And in this case, you have to have application difference when the test was passing and application uh, history when the test failed. So right now, you can do this in Cypress at the surface level because it records video of everything it runs. So usually what happens you know, with me when I was doing a lot of testing was I would look at the, at the video of a failing test. I would find the first previous build or last previous build where the test was passing, and I would grab and look at the video there, and I would just look at two videos trying to understand what visually, like what has changed. But it's only going at a visual level. But the application has, is doing a lot more under the hood. You know that it's doing a lot under the hood. If you open the DevTools and you look at the network tab, Application downloads a bunch of HTML, downloads styles, downloads code, but code starts doing something where a cookie is set, you know, uh, where is storage affected, where are API calls to the server, where is user interaction, where is a lot of things that the application is doing and that our test could record. So it actually knows what was you know, going on during successful tests and what is going on during the failing test. So if you think about the test duration, and we're just looking at a particular one end-to-end -end test. You have a lot of events, and the green line is kind of like events during the successful build. And the red is kind of a line of events during a failing test. So what we want to do is go back and figure out if there is a difference that we detected and the test failed, where is that moment where something changed in the behavior of a test, in the behavior of application. Can we actually tell you, hey, API call happened, but it returned something else, not what you expected. And then later, after something happened, the DOM actually showed something else, not what you expected. But we really are interested in this event. So the test history and comparison and the diff explains why the page changed, right? So the screenshot diffing is what has changed. The HTML DOM diff is, you know, how. And this explains why. We, it means we have to record everything, right? We have to record network calls. Luckily, you know, Cypress already records, I mean, not, it proxies everything. It, it has direct access to your you know, code, to the local storage, to you know, your web workers. So it actually can record everything. And we kind of think of this as imagine HAR, but with everything else, with application-specific things. And once we record this, 
when instead of kind of going back to your car and seeing a scratch and there is no one else and you're like, oh my God, there is something bad. How did this happen? You'll be able to figure out, oh wow, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what happened. Imagine instead of a scratch on your car, you'll have full video of every accident. You know, car telemetry, driver's bio science, but not only during the crash, but all the times it previously passed without scratching you. That's our, you know, what we think. And I think it, whoever does this first automatically will be a huge winner in testing. If you record everything, you have a big data problem. So finally, we'll use some buzzwords. I think uh, it's not enough to have data. You need the insight. Uh, Jesus, like. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a little square cell phone, you know, like right there. So I think a lot of big data, even if you have to apply buzzwords like artificial intelligence and machine learning and crypto mining, right? <laughs> that's what <laughs> will make the passing test, but that's what right now just sit there wasting, you know, electricity and disk space and your time. It will make the test a lot more useful, and especially when the failure happens, you'll be able to, to find out why immediately. Okay, oh, the buzzwords are here, okay. Um, so I, I wanna finish with a couple of parting thoughts. Brian showed you know, how we think about end-to-end -end testing. To us, end-to-end -end should do the same things that a human user would do to a fully deployed system, right? That means real browsers, real interaction, no shortcuts, a little bit of stubbing is okay. End-to-end -to -end tools, I think, can come down and be really, really useful for component level testing. I, I think the future will be seeing your component live and having tests you know, um, at that level. And finally, diffing, like snapshot diffing, is the new it. And it's a BDD joke, anyone? No, okay. So snapshot testing is great. Screenshot diffing is becoming mainstream, right? So talk to everyone, Apple Tools, for example. But I think the test behavior diffing will be the next big thing. Thank you.